by Dr. Aziz, by Dr. Aziz Abdullah and Dr. Farhan. Uh, this evening session is focusing on prostate and bladder cancer. And we have got some really good speakers who are going to cover most aspects of, uh, of prostate and bladder cancer. So there is a first talk is by Dr. Nahar Raza. He is a consultant urological surgeon. He was trained in uh, uh, Karachi in AKU and in US. He's a fellowship trained surgeon in neuro-oncology. So he's going to talk about prostate cancer uh, and uh, he will be available for all your questions. So please uh, write your comments and questions in the chat box and we will address them uh, immediately after his presentation. So are we ready to start the presentation, uh, Sharif? Assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, thank you very much Dr. Hamad for inviting me to uh, present uh, for the uh, for the Karachi um, Urology Week um, and I must commend the effort that you put in and your team um, in organizing this. Uh, Uh, and the ureter um, of the kidney. These uh, comprise 90% uh, of the upper tract malignancies and they are all in urothelial origin. However, you can find variants like squamous cell or no or small cell in very small percentages. You also have benign tumors that you need to watch out for, um, stuff like fibroepithelial polyps and motor papilloma, cystic urethritis, and von Brun's mess as well. About 5 to 10 percent of the urothelial uh, cancers are upper tract in origin, with a more, more male uh, predominant um, uh, disease in terms of uh, the um, uh, uh, predisposition to the uh, uh, gender. When you compare the stage to stage outcomes, uh, it is similar for the uh, disease in renal pelvis uh, compared to the um, urethral um, upper tract urethral carcinoma. When we look at the risk factors, um, uh, smoking is uh, one of the major risk factors, which is dose dependent, uh, comprising of about 25 to 60% of the uh, disease. Along with that, you can have uh, primary bladder cancer is again an additional risk factor for upper tract disease, especially if uh, you have multifocal NCIS um, in, within the bladder. Um, once um, you use uh, urethral stents at the time of QRBT, you can have uh, uh, upper tract seeding as well. So that's another uh, risk factor in development of upper tract disease. And about 40% uh, patients uh, have bladder cancer, uh, those with uh, upper tract uh, urethelial disease. And that's something to watch out for when you're uh, dealing with upper tract disease to keep uh, bladder cancer surveillance in check. Uh, Phenacetin uh, is an analgesic, which is off market now, but it, was, um, it had some alanine kind of... Uh, similar um, composition, which resulted in uh, upper tract uh, recurrences. Um, uh, another key thing to look out for is Lynch syndrome. Uh, and I would just spend a little time here to highlight because this is ideal for questions and stuff that um, you can find um, uh, patients with uh, um, uh, 10, 10 to 20% of those patients with Lynch syndrome can develop upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Um, uh, younger men, with history of uh, family history or personal history of colon, um, sebaceous uh, glands, or women with endometrial ovarian cancers do have um, a higher suspicion of uh, Lynch syndrome. Um, so uh, at present, there are no established guidelines for these uh, for screening, but um, NCCN suggests um, an early year analysis and, and accordingly uh, follow up for microhematuria either um, for, these, uh, for these patients. Um, so when we move on, grading and staging is much similar to um, that for bladder cancer. Um, there are some differences. However, um, if you do not have a visible tumor, 
but you have positive cytology. Uh, this, is, this is kind of cons considered consistent with carcinoma in situ. Um, um, in T2 disease, uh, it, because of this thin muscularis layer, it is difficult to diagnose on biopsy or on imaging. Um, and that also makes it more likely for, especially the urethral cancers, um, tumors to be more um, um, sort of advanced um, and, and do present with um, uh, T3 disease rather than uh, T1 or T2. Um, European Association of Urology came up with this um, uh, breast stratification for uh, um, uh, the upper tract tumors. It is helpful to determine if the patient can be a candidate for organ screening um, management or uh, for radical nephrid urethrectomy. Um, uh, keep in mind, though, that the, the, the uh, variables that have been identified for low risk, they have to you have to meet all the variables. Um, management or uh, for radical nephrid urethrectomy. Um, uh, keep in mind, though, that the, the, the uh, variables that have been identified for low risk, they have to you have to meet all the variables. Uh, whereas for high risk disease, uh, you have to um, any of the variables comprise it uh, comprises uh, it to be of uh, high risk disease. So after risk stratification, your association, uh, association of uh, EAU guidelines do have a nice algorithm uh, which allows you to uh, follow the pathway and this is exactly what I would Here. Um, so if you can see, um, you have, um, um, you can see the filling defects as pointed out by the arrow on the CT urogram, delayed phase. And if you um, cannot perform for, for any reasons, uh, 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 cross-section imaging, then you should obtain an ultrasound along with retrograde pyrogram. And as you can see on this retrograde pyrogram, you've got a big um, uh, defect. I think it says 15 minutes. It may be an IUD or an IUD. But you would see a feeling def filling defect on retrograde uh, uh, imaging. Now, the thing is that you may... Um, uh, sorry about this. Okay, um, you, the, the key thing is to know the differentials um, of a filling defect. It can be a, a blood clot, it can be a fungal ball, um, uh, but the, the, that is why it is important and very, very, uh, it is imperative to get an, a diagnostic endoscopy and get a biopsy before uh, planning for any radical treatment uh, because you don't want to be disappointed uh, by moving, removing a kidney for uh, um, you know, a fungal block, or a ball or big uh, blood clot or disintegrated papilla. Uh, if you have positive cytology and a negative cystoscopy, then you should not only consider random blood biopsies, but also get bilateral selective um, uh, urines for cytology to rule out the upper tract urine cellular carcinoma. If you do not have a biopsy, then at least obtain a cytology from that side because if the cytology is positive, uh, it's uh, highly diagnostic of uh, CIS. Um, uh, the um, uh, novel studies um, uh, for, uh, like FISH and NMD22, there is limited data uh, on, available on, the, uh, on their application and they're only um, you know, just in uh, infancy and, and uh, very expensive to perform. Um, uh, 
Um, going back to the algorithm. So we are looking at the, um, on the low risk side of the upper tracheal arteria. You can do a kidney sparing surgery with, a, with the help of flexible ureteroscopy, or you can do a segmental resection, resection or a percutaneous uh, approach can be employed. So when, com when it comes to endoscopic uh, management, it is usually preferred in low volume, low grade disease, as you can see tiny tumors along the ureter or up in the uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, pelvis and the calyces. Um, you must make sure that it is accessible via flexible ureteroscopy uh, and you are able to completely ablate or remove the disease. You can choose to do laser, laser abrasion or uh, monopolar uh, fulguration. Um, uh, however, if you have a larger tumor, especially in the collecting system or in the renal pelvis, you could um, percutaneously approach them and perform a, a trans, um, uh, trans nephro nephrological resection of the uh, upper, tree, upper tracheal. Um, when you compare uh, the um, radical nephrouretectomy with uh, endoscopic management, endoscopic management is associated with higher risk of recurrence, but, um, uh, but there is no uh, associated high risk of death or metastasis um, in these patients. And this came right off the, uh, out of the press like two days ago, a study from uh, Israel which uh, basically compared retrospective studies, small numbers, but it did, it's a long follow-up and compared the endoscopic management with um, radical uh, nephrouretectomy. Um, and, and the overall survival rate was similar or comparable in both groups, uh, along with uh, metastas metastasis pre and cancer specific survival. Um, the end of uh, follow-up uh, GFR or kidney function were also comparable between the two groups. Um, uh, interestingly, 92% of the endoscopic management patients had local recurrences and about an average of 3.2 recurrence per patient and, and requiring an average of 6.4 patient procedures per patient, which has some financial implication as if you look at it in the long run, um, in, in depending on which sort of, uh, which sort of uh, uh, insurance setup or, or payment method you're looking at. 17% uh, of the patients required a salvage radical um in this study. So, um, so the, the, the whole idea is that you can manage low-grade upper tract urethelial with endoscopic management with, um, uh, with satisfactory overall uh, cancer specific and uh, metastasis uh, free survival. Um, then comes the segmental resection part. Um, if, uh, you can, if you have proximal tumors, you can do primary ureter ureterostomies after excision of the disease segment or you can do um, ureterocalicostomy. You can also uh, swing the ureter over to the um, other side to retain the continuity of the urinary tract. If you're looking at the mid ureteral tumors, like I said, you can do a primary ureter ureterostomy, or if it's a longer segment, you can excise the entire segment and you can do ileal uh, interposition, a very cool operation. Um, uh, if you are looking at um, distal ureteral tumors, uh, ureteral de-implant uh, with either swastik or buari flap, um, and, and keep in mind the bladder capacity for bodies um, can be employed uh, to um, remove the disease part um, and, uh, and salvage the, um, the system altogether. Um, remember to do an excision on the bladder cuff when you do the distal uh, ureterectomy. Uh, regional lymphadenectomy is, is recommended for patients um, who are undergoing um, uh, uh, these uh, procedures and they can be uh, performed open laparoscopic or robotically. Then comes the role of intracavity tre um, treatment. BCG has been utilized for bladder cancer and uh, similarly, um, its uh, efficacy has been uh, reported um, in, in upper tract uh, disease as well, uh, comparable. Um, however, the treatment of, uh, the efficacy of the treatment of T1 and TA lesions is lower with a higher recurrence and progression rate. Um, there is a theoretical risk of pylovenous backflow in the kidney, which may result in the higher systemic absorption of uh, in any, any um, agent like BCG, uh, which can result in sepsis or myelosuppression from uh, cytotoxic chemotherapeutic agent. At the moment, BCG installation in the upper tract is not uh, advocated by any guidelines um, as routine management of um, uh, upper tract urethelia. Usually it is done from case to case basis. This is something new, um, recently um, uh, introduced. Um, it is uh, basically the same intracavity treatment. Mitomycin uh, is used in a uh, hydrogel preparation where it is in a liquid state in a cold, in, in cold temperature 
and it forms into a gel-like um, uh, uh, substance at uh, body temperature, which slowly disintegrates itself and, and later passed on. This is um, instilled into the upper tract uh, in, a, in a fluid uh, form in cold state, and then it warms and gelatinizes itself. Um, uh, it, FDA has recently approved this for the treatment of low-grade um, upper tract urethelial cancers. Um, and this was based on a lumpus trial. Um, we'll just talk about it in a second. The, um, the role of mitomycin here is not just um, like we do post-resection, uh, but also in, it, is, it is utilizing the um, chemoablative properties of uh, mitomycin as well. So um, this is what uh, the Olympus trial basically looked at and, and sort of, uh, it was a phase three single arm uh, prospective clinical trial uh, in which uh, patients had low grade papillary tumor, at least less than 1.5 centimeter in size and, and no um, high grade disease. 48% um, uh, tumors were unreachable uh, by laser at baseline. So that's, that's a very interesting fact. Six weekly in retrograde installations were performed, um, which was then followed by uretroscopic evaluation, cytology, and uh, for cause, cause biopsy. The primary outcome was a uh, complete response at three months. Um, they had about 71 patients uh, in that trial, and the complete response rate was up to 60%. Uh, with an additional 11% uh, dem demonstrating a partial response. Uh, they did note that uh, up to 12 months of follow-up, the uh, complete response was sustained in about 70% of the patients. One of the major um, adverse events, other than um, some genetic um, issues, was about 44% of urethral stenosis, which is kind of you know, alarming for, um, for this kind of procedure. So um, you, know, you have to be very careful with this. I think the best way to um, uh, administer this is uh, through a percutaneous nephrostomy tube, um, uh, which is an alternative to uh, having a stent in place or, or doing retrograde uh, manipulation of the uh, upper urinary tract. Um, moving on. Um, uh, keep in mind the follow-up uh, when you do an organ sparing treatment, you have to keep an eye on um, the uh, disease. If, you, if it's a low-risk disease, um, Eutroscopy at three months, um, and then for the follow up with the help of um, uh, imaging. But if it is high risk, you may have to perform more vigilant um, under vision uh, surveillance of the upper tract. Um, going back to our algorithm, looking at the high risk, uh, looking at the high risk um, uh, half of the algorithm, we are now talking about uh, more uh, extensive disease with uh, regards to. Um, uh, the upper tract disease and more extensive treatment, which is uh, radical upper tract um, lymph node dissection. So, um, radical nephrotectomy is a gold standard. Um, basically, you do um, nephrectomy, uterectomy, and make sure that you get the bladder uh, cough excision. Um, and this is a gold standard for um, high grade disease. Um, I won't go into the details, but you take the kidney out exactly that way, RCC. Uh, mobilize outside the gelotas. You can do adrenal sparing if there's no obvious involvement. Um, uh, it is recommended to do, do an early clipping of the ureter to, in order to prevent a drop down metastases um, of, uh, of the tumor. Um, um, bladder calf can be done um, with, the, with various methods. You can do it endoscopically, you can do it uh, transvesical or extravesical uh, approaches. Um, sorry about that. Um, um, if you if you have a bladder, uh, you know a, a tight um, watertight bladder, uh, bladder closure, then an intravesical um, chemotherapeutic agent is recommended uh, to prevent recurrence. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, Nephro-U can be obtained. Uh, it can be performed uh, laparoscopically, robotically, or open. When you do it open, you have to make uh, two incisions: one in the flank for the kidney and um, uh, the proximal or the mid ureter part, and then a lower Gibson incision for the distal ureter and the um, bladder cuff. Uh, when, you do a, when you do it laparoscopically or robotically, you may have to reconfigure uh, the um, uh, uh, port configuration in order to access the upper abdomen and the pelvis um, easily.
is a bit of a um, controversial topic. Um, initially, there was a there was no um, there has always been a, a, a debate about whether this is more there is more therapeutic benefit to it or not, uh, rather than just having um, uh, a, a diagnostic or staging benefit um, from there. But more recently, a large population based study did reveal that a five year cancer specific survival for patients with, was, was less for patients with node positive disease compared to who did not have node dissection or those who had um, uh, node negative disease. Um, however, the lymph node status itself uh, was not an independent predictor of cancer specific survival when uh, a subset of population was um, analyzed. Um, and uh, uh, but within, within the uh, extent of the disease, like for example, if you had high, um, uh, high T stage um, or LBI, um, there was a, a staging benefit uh, for this subgroup disease where you could identify and pick up um, the presence of uh, lymph node metastases. Um, it was also noted that patients who had lymph node positive disease, increasing the number of, um, of lymph node uh, yield uh, was a predictor of local recurrence, but it was not associated with cancer specific, specific mortality. Um, and like I said, the survival advantage is usually noted with higher T stage and complete lymph node dissection. Uh, therefore, uh, lymph node dissection is more um, recommended on a template based, and as you can see on the right hand side, a bunch of templates are, are, are reported. Uh, Martin's most uh, recent one in general of urology that looked at the um, templates. And basically, if you, if you, if you look at this um, side, you can identify that if you do just the hyla and, uh, um, um, and, and uh, retrocable lymph node dissection, but you add intra cable, you can increase your uh, uh, chances of lymph node, uh, prediction of lymph node metastasis up to 95%. Um, so that, this, this is how they uh, basically look at uh, including the various templates into your lymph node dissection. And like I said, it can up to 100% of lymph node metastases can be picked up if you follow those um, lymph node um, uh, uh, lymphatic pack uh, uh, templates, dissection templates. Um, if you have uh, greater than eight lymph nodes, um, it, it, it is related to cancer specific mortality and about, um, it has a 75% predictability of the lymph node uh, metastases. Um, uh, and, and that is the minimum number of lymph nodes required to declare a PN0 status. Uh, lymph node density, um, is, uh, is another uh, predictor, uh, which has been no noted to be, um, if it is greater than 30% as a predictor of uh, poor overall um, uh, survival. Um, moving on, uh, let's talk about perioperative chemotherapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, basically, the main aim of administering neoadjuvant chemotherapy is to utilize as much uh, renal function the patient has, um, in order to prevent, uh, in order to make them eligible for cisplatin-based uh, chemotherapy, which they would not be um, afterwards. So gemcitabine uh, and um, cisplatin or um, the MVAC uh, 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 regimens are available and have been reported. Uh, there is about 15% rate of PT2 disease, um, along with um, uh, significant downstaging. A couple of trials have also um, reported about similar rates of uh, success in terms of complete response with um, dose dense and back in, in a new adjuvant chemotherapy in uh, such patients. There are also um, um, immunotherapy based clinical trials, which are looking at new adjuvant chemotherapy uh, as an alternative for patients who um, have, who are eligible to receive cisplatin um, for their uh, disease management. Uh, one important thing that I would like to highlight, highlight uh, here is the PL trial, uh, which basically looked at the perioperative chemotherapy versus surveillance in the appropriate disease. It, it's a phase three randomized trial, um, which basically um, looked at patients who had uh, nephroeurotrectomy uh, with advanced stage lymph node disease um, and, um, and compared uh, them with four cycles of gemcitabine or cisplatin or gem carbo if, the, if they had lower GFR. Uh, compared to uh, just surveillance um, after nephrodectomy. The progression-free survival uh, favored the chemotherapy uh, group, uh, statistically, uh, uh, which was statistically significant. Um, and patients who um, uh, received the chemotherapy demonstrated 
uh, and improve disease-free uh, survival up to a median follow-up 30, uh, 30 months. Uh, 30, uh, months. Um, it, the, the, the disease specific survival was about 70%, uh, disease-free survival was about 70% uh, for patients who received chemotherapy versus um, those um, who received um, surveillance alone, which was about 50%. Um, uh, another meta-analysis um, we recently published, which looked at the new adjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, unfortunately, there are no high level of evidence other than level two evidence for new adjuvant chemotherapy but um, a pooled analysis did uh, report 11% um, response rate, uh, in uh, complete response rate versus about 43% partial response rate. And then the cancer specific and overall survival were compared, it favored the new adjuvant chemotherapy group. Uh, with adjuvant chemotherapy group, uh, like I said, uh, the PIAO trial and another trial from China did report, um, does, uh, it, there is a level one evidence available for that. And that also uh, favors um, uh, patients having um, um, adjuvant chemotherapy. There are a bunch of uh, new adjuvant and adjuvant immunotherapy trials ongoing, and we are keenly looking, uh, waiting to look at their results as well. Um, so lastly, um, uh, uh, let's look at the single post-operative dose of intravascular chemotherapy. Um, it's important that you want to uh, limit the drop-down metastases and prevent any bladder recurrences after uh, nephrohydrectomy. Uh, there have been uh, trials uh, that looked at utilization of uh, single-dose intravesical chemotherapy <clears throat> around the time of nephrohydrectomy to prevent bladder recurrence. Um, and um, uh, when the uh, 100, uh, the uh, um, ARDMIT trial uh, looked at 40 uh, milligrams of mitomycin versus standard of care in these patients, and the recurrence rate was about 16% in treatment arm versus 27% in the control arm. Uh, the absolute risk reduction was about 11%, um, and uh, number needed to prevent one bladder tumor recurrence was nine. So if you do instill a chemotherapy in nine patients, one, uh, one of them will not have, uh, in order to prevent one recurrence, you have to treat nine patients. Um, this uh, intravascular installation is recommended. Um, it can be gemcitabine or mitomycin, whichever is available. Um, it, and it is usually administered before the removal of Foley catheter. Um, some people do it at the time of the surgery when they, they see that there's no obvious leak. Some people choose to do it at a delayed time, um, uh, more at the time, the time at the time of the cystogram um, when they have, you know, radiologically leaked. Uh, proof uh, ruled out any bladder leak uh, prior to installation. Um, so in summary, um, for upper tract disease, uretroscopy biopsy is the key in diagnosis. Um, low grade and low volume disease can be uh, managed with nephron sparing approach. New adjuvant chemotherapy is about 10 to 11 to 14% response, complete response rate. So it should be considered, especially um, prior to uh, loss of renal function and in patients with high grade uh, and high risk features of the disease. Um, template based uh, lymph node dissection should be performed um, um, because of uh, improved staging uh, uh, benefit and uh, may have some uh, potential role in, uh, in therapeutic uh, and prognostic uh, ways as well. Um, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, we, have, we have level one evidence that it improves outcomes for the patients with advanced disease. So that should be offered to all patients. Um, a single installation of mitomycin with gemcitabine should be performed perioperatively to reduce um, drop, down, drop down metastases and bladder recurrences. Um, again, remember 40% of the upper tract disease develops bladder cancer. So please do not forget to survey the bladder and keep it under your close check. Thank you very much. And maybe we can switch to uh, questions in a second.
Dr. George, there are a few questions in the chat box. So the question is, um, should we do ureterostomy and proximal ureter cancer as if we are anastomosing disease ureter to a normal ureter? Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, you've already done a, a ureteroscopy and ruled out any obvious disease. So in that case, obviously you have to make sure that when you do this, there is no obvious disease left. Um, and that's why I think if you go back to the surveillance part, it's important to survey these patients in order to make sure that uh, there is no disease recurrence. And another reason why the um, endoscopic management trials have got, or studies have higher rate of recurrences is probably because it's a field change disease. Um, so yes, you can. Again, it depends on the volume of disease um, and, and, the, and the grade of the disease. Uh, if you have low risk tumors, lymphadenectomy, is it needed? Uh, you can argue that. Um, uh, I, I don't think you should do a dedicated lymph node dissection in, in those cases um, because your imaging will probably be directing that. Uh, ironically, um, having one of the trials, uh, one of the studies reported uh, a high um, uh, positivity rate for or, or prediction uh, with even just two lymph nodes. So probably for, um, it was for, for high risk disease. So in case of low risk disease, you could consider omitting uh, lymph node dissection. Anything else? I'm sorry, I, my, my talk ran over time, over the time limit, but um, once again, thank you very much for allowing me to participate. And, uh, Maybe I can put my email address in the chat if somebody wants to send questions out or need anything else. There's, uh, um, we can we can do. That's a good question. Is if is, is there a safe margin limit? Um, there is no safe margin limit as as long as you have visually negative um, uh, disease uh, to be on the safe side. Yes, you can send a frozen section um, that will make it more comprehensive uh, in terms of your. Um, operative uh, comfort that you've taken out the disease segment. Yes, I would recommend a frozen section. Nope, I just sent it to Busha. Send it to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, uh, for your nice presentation. I am Dr. Abdul Afiz. So I think I Thank should, uh, yeah, I think I should proceed for my presentation. Yes, please. Sorry, I took you five minutes. Go ahead. I want to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We do. So, should I proceed, uh, Sharif? Thank you. I am visible to all or not? Yes, sir, you are visible and your presentation is also visible, sir. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the chance to present the one of the interesting topic uh, that is uh, the what the current guideline says about the cytoreductive nephrectomy and the metastasectomy. So before going to the, my presentation, I would like to give you that uh, at the end of my presentation, the participant would be able to understand what is the cytoreductive nephrectomy and uh, the metastasectomy. And uh, at the end, they will be able to select the patients for the who needs cytoreductive nephrectomy and metastasectomy. And the fourth one is the, uh, the certain, the, the literature review about the cytoreductive. And at the last, I would uh, talk about the guidelines. So everyone must be aware about uh, these, uh, the but I would be more interested to look these stage four disease that uh, the patient who have whatever the T stages, but have the synchronous metastatic lesion in the body.
So by the looking the definition that uh, the cytoreductive nephrectomy is uh, the uh, removal of the primary tumor uh, in the presence of synchronous metastatic lesion. While the complete metastasectomy is the surgical resection of all clinical evident metastatic disease. So uh, before going to the uh, detail, uh, I would like to give certain introduction, certain introduction about the, the metastatic RCC that we don't have any uh, the correct statistics about the Pakistan that this, this their data is from the, the US that approximately 16% of the patients who have uh, the renal cell carcinoma, they present with the metastatic disease. And by the looking at the overall survival, that is about the 12%, but it depends upon the, what the category of the patient is, either it's a favorable, intermediate, or the poor risk. So then in the last uh, many years, uh, the, the lot, a lot of uh, advances has been uh, done in the management of the metastatic RCC. That is uh, the, uh, the patients who have uh, the metastatic disease, they started with the cytokine therapy till the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So those patients who have uh, the, uh, uh, starting for the, from the cytokine therapy, because they start, they start off uh, the metastatic treatment, the patients who uh, before the 2006, they started with interferon and interleukin 2. But by the looking at the toxicity of the, the, uh, this treatment, the, that has been now uh, obsolete. By the looking the randomized control trials uh, uh, has been done in the 2000, uh, 2000 uh, one, the, the patient who have the only saturated nephrectomy along with interferon and interferon alpha, that the patient who have the saturated along with the interferon have the good overall survival. So over the last uh, many years, the now the advances in the like uh, medical treatment of the metastatic RCC, that is immune checkpoint inhibitors, which targets the PD-1 and the PD-L1 and CTLA-4 pathway. So yes, uh, whatever if the patient uh, who comes in your clinic uh, with a metastatic uh, RCC, you have to select the patient uh, accordingly. So there are certain factors by looking the patient, one starting from the patient uh, point of view, that the patient, we always categorize the patient by looking at the IMDC or MSKCC criteria. So this is the, the risk factors where for which we can categorize the patients into favorable, intermittent, and poor risk categories. So always remember that whenever the patient who comes in your clinic with the, and you have diagnosed that it's a metastatic RCC, then you have to look the, these three uh, the things in your mind. One is the patient, other is the disease, and third one is the health facility, what available you have. Coming towards the, uh, the categorization of the patient, which is either by the MSKCC or IMDC, which is International Metastatic uh, RCC uh, Data Consortium. So these are certain things which you have to look in the patient, like starting with the, these criteria. And second thing, uh, which is here, which I will uh, point out that performance status is very important in the patient, because the patient who have the metastatic disease, they, you, you have to always look the, the performance status. The patients who have the good performance status, they will uh, the, bear the, the major surgery along with the, the metastatic lesion excision. And second and last, the third thing in the patients, the symptoms. Obviously, the patient who have the metastatic disease, usually they have uh, the, the symptoms like have the hematuria or the patient with the compression symptoms. So you have to look the symptoms of the patients. Number second is the, the tumor per se. So uh, whenever the patient will have the tumor, uh, you have to look certain factors in the tumor as well. So starting from the thrombus, either the patient will have the presence of the thrombus or not. So the patients who have, there is a promising data that shows that uh, the patient who have the, the thrombus, which is infrahepatic and the, the suprahepatic. So the patient who have the level four thrombus, which is a supradiaphragmatic, obviously have the very poor, poor blood muscle factor. So these patients are not ideal candidate for the cytoreductive surgery. Coming towards the, the, the second point, which is a metastasis, obviously the number of the lesions and the location is very important. So there are a lot of data regarding the location of the disease. The patients who have the single lesion or oligometastasis in the lungs uh, always have the better prognosis than the lesion in the brain or the bone. So uh, again, this is the location is very important. Number third, if you have uh, the pre-surgery, you have the biopsy, like a clear cell or the non-clear cell or sarcomatoid differentiation. Obviously, sarco sarcomatoid differentiation have the poor prognostic uh, uh, factor that uh, because uh, if we look the, the literature that uh, many articles have published that present 
spectrometer differentiation is a prognostic indicator for the survival in a surgical treated metal cytic RCC. So the data is published in 2017 and 2020 as well. So the sarcometer differentiation, if you have the pre-surgery, you have the biopsy, obviously this is have the poor prognostic factor. And the, and the last one is the, the tumor size. If the, the tumor size is more than four centimeter and the less than four centimeter, which have also impact on the patient, the survival. And the last one is the system. System means the hospital volume, like the, the people who are coming in the tertiary care setup, which have the all facilities of the this major surgery, number one, and number two, the patient who are the, the hospital have the expertise and the experience of the patient who are dealing with these metastatic lesions. So obviously with the time, with the experience, they have the good surgical outcome of the patient if those patients are treated in that the tertiary care hospital. And then the, the third thing is in this that the patient the, the, the hospital should have the multidisciplinary approach. So these patients should be, whenever the patient who comes in your clinic, these three factors you, you should keep in your mind when you were thinking about going for cytoprotective surgery. So uh, this is the algorithm of the patient who uh, comes in your clinic, then you have to start with the, the basic uh, workup, uh, starting from the complete blood count, then uh, the metabolic workup, then the radiological, like the CT chest, abdomen, the pelvis with contrast, so you have to look the where the disease is, either it's presence in the eye or the oligometastases or the single lesion or the all over the body, which is infiltrated with the lesion. Then coming towards the bone scan, looking for the MRI brain. And if you have the plus virus biopsy. So this is the starting from the, the stage of the disease, you have to state the patient. Then second line, if you look the evaluate the patient by looking the prognostic factor. Is I already discussed with you that you have to uh, categorize the patient with the, the risk category by, by the doing the IACR MSKCC criteria. Then in which you can see there's a hospital, uh, the, uh, it's very important that you have to look, the, the multidisciplinary team should be there. So uh, and on the left side, you can see in this algorithm that the patient who had the, the favorable or interpreted risk category, they are really ideally candidate for going for the cytoreductive nephrectomy on the left side. By looking the, the, the again, the performance status, which I already discussed about it, the patient who have the limited metastatic lesions, like uh, the patient who have the single lesion of the oligometastases, or uh, even the, the look of the lesion is very important. And looking for the symptomatic primary tumor. So these are the patients who are ideal candidate, which can be uh, 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 can go for the cytoreductive nephrectomy. So there are a lot of data which is available, and almost all the studies are the retrospective studies that has uh, compared with the, the patient who have the cytoreductive and without the cytoreductive that have the, the follow -up. And if you look the overall uh, on the right side at the uh, slide, you can see the overall survival in the patients by looking at the hazard ratio, it's almost less than one in around 80 to 90% of the patient. So that shows that the patient who had the, the cytoreductive nephrectomy uh, had the overall survival is better than those who haven't. So looking at the certain systemic review uh, has been published in uh, the 2019 in the European Urology that shows that uh, the, in which they, they look the, the patient who compared with the saturoreductive versus no saturoreductive and uh, they assess the overall survival in the patients who have the metastatic disease. So the fact they look that the nephrectomy is a still role in the patient who have the limited burden of the metastasis. We, we already discussed about the whenever you think about uh, the patients who uh, need the saturoreductive surgery and uh, the, those who have the, the small lesions or single lesion or oligometastases, and also by looking at the other factors, they usually the patients who are candidate for the going for the cytoreductive surgery. So the, another, you can look the, the another article which was published in the Journal of Urology in 2004 by looking the cytoreductive surgery in a patient with the, the metastatic RCC. They, they basically uh, uh, divide the patients, uh, 331 patients in the two identical protocols, and uh, they look the, the cytoreductive nephrectomy plus interferon and interferon alpha only. So if you look the patient who have only treated the systemic therapy, they look the primary endpoint was the overall survival and the second endpoint, they look the response rate in the patients. So the pre randomization they look the performance status of the patient, they look the site of metastases, and they look the disease measurability. And at the last, they looked at that the results were the median survival was 30 months in cytoreductive along with interferon and those who have only the interferon alone, they had the low overall survival. Coming to what the saturated affecting again, that uh, the patient who had uh, the complete metastatic removal of the disease or not, 
So it's institutional experience that uh, they shared with the cytoreductive alone, the cytoreductive with the metastasectomy. So they looked the data from 1989 till 2003 that they looked the median overall survival for the patients who undergone the cytoreductive surgery plus metastasectomy was 30 months. But if you compare with the cytoreductive nephrectomy, only, only 12 months. So there was significant difference between the patient who had the cytoreductive along with metastatic lesion excision. So another look at the article which was published in European Euro in 2019, they looked the surgical metastasectomy in an RCC. It was again a system review. They looked the median overall survival in the patients. Uh, it was around 36 to 142 months, those who had the surgical excision, while which compared with the 8 to 27 months who, who didn't have any surgical excision. They looked the what are what were the important prognostic factors in a patient who have the good overall survival was the complete resection of the metastatic lesion. So the, this, this point is very important when the lesion are uh, amenable for the complete resection, the ideally the patient and also you have to consider the other factors like uh, the patient factors, which uh, I described you in a, in a, in a tri triangular diagram that uh, this is also, also very much important. So they look other factors as well like tumor size, sarcometroid features, they look for this number of metastases and also the performance status. Almost the, all the same things which are uh, I described you in a previous slides that uh, this, these are the very important things. So coming to the isolated liver rejection, if the patient who have the solitary lesion in the liver and uh, they, they showed about the 12 year retrospective study in a, in a uh, published in one of the article words in Mathurology that they looked the lesion by comparing the patients who didn't have any surgical excision of that liver lesion. So the look about the overall survival of the patient at the five year after metastatectomy was 62% in a patient and uh, uh, they, had, they had had about the median survival was 142 months. But if you compare with the patient who didn't have the surgical excision of the metastatic lesion, they have only 29% with 27 months. You can see on the right side, the Kaplan near curve that shows the upper line which shows about the patients who have around the 60 uh, percent, uh, the you know, five-year survival rate, while the patient who have the, the 20, around the 22 or 26 percent survival rate, to the patient who didn't have any surgical excision of the liver metastatic lesion. Coming towards the isolated, the pancreatic metastatic lesion, the patients who have the RCC, metastatic RCC, they, there were retrospective study, they looked about 36 patients who had the pancreatic lesion, and they looked the data about 1998 till the 2006, around 18 years data, that they looked at 23 patients, they, they did these the following surgeries, like 11 patients had the distant pancreatectomy, and 5 had enucleation, 4 had pancreatectomy, 2 had the complete pancreas removal, and 1 had the middle pancreatectomy. So they looked at the 5-year actual survival rate, which was 88%, and the median disease survival was, uh, survival was 44 months. But the patient who didn't have any surgery, the 5-year survival was much lesser, which is about 47%. So this is also the suggest the data that the, the, the surgical excision of the pancreatic lesion have been good survival. Coming towards the lung metastatic lesion, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, the, the, if you look the, the metastatic lesion in the body, the lung metastatic lesion have the better prognosis in all over the metastatic lesions because uh, there are the lot of data suggest about the metastatic lesion in the lung have the favorable outcome if you are doing this complete surgical excision. So it's one of the most frequent sites, as we know, because there are the three the main frequent sites of the, the RCC, metastatic RCC. Number one is the lung, number two is the liver, and number three is the bones. So these are the mainly three lesions, three sites for the, the common sites for the uh, metastatic uh, RCC. So this is the retrospective study that was uh, done uh, from uh, the 2000 to 2016, about 16 years study. The 27 patients who underwent the pulmonary dissection of that lesion and they looked the outcomes and prognostic factors which were associated with the survival of the complete the pulmonary dissection. And uh, they looked the five to 10 year overall survival was 75% and 59% respectively. They again looked the what, what were the independent prognostic factors for the survival. They looked the dimension, it means the size of the lesion, which is more than seven, more than two centimeter. And uh, they looked the disease free uh, uh, interval in a patient which is about the five years. So the only independent prognosis factor which was affecting the disease-free interval was the dimension, it means the size of the pulmonary lesion. 
So now come towards the um, NCCN uh, guidelines. What the guidelines says about it, because we have seen the literature, I have just described you how you proceed the patient who have the metastatic lesion. So uh, the booking the, the 2021 guidelines, NCCN, what the NCCN says. So uh, here I would like to uh, give you, because the talk on the stage four disease, so the stage four disease, it means that whatever the T is, but the patient will have the synchronous metastatic lesion. So if the potentially surgically rejectable uh, the disease, which I, I told you either it's oligometastasis or the single lesion, then you can go for the cytonephrotin in selected patients. So this is the, again, in every slide, there is selected patients, not all the patients are the, the candidate for going for the cytoreductive surgery. So again, if you have the clear histology or you have the recurrence of the disease, you have done the primary surgery, you have done the radical surgery for the patient and after the six month, after one year, you have a single lesion, you have a clear histology, obviously you should go for the metastasectomy. Again, looking for the non-clear cell, the NCCN says the metastasectomy have the role. Coming towards the EAU guidelines on the renal cell carcinoma, what the EAU guidelines says about the cytoreductive surgery. So you can look at the cytoreductive nephrectomy in a patient where the simultaneous complete resection of a single metastasis or oligometastasis may improve survival and delay the systemic therapy. So in the last, uh, so uh, at the conclusion, uh, we, we have uh, now well aware about the, what is the cytoreductive surgery? What is the metastasectomy? And there's a, a significant evidence that shows the cytoreductive nephrectomy have the benefit in the patients who have the management, symptomatic management and survival standpoint of view in a selected patient again. And selection is nonce process. Uh, decision making with the patient is very important and multidisciplinary setting is very important. And there should be some experience with the urological surgeons and medical orthologists. Thank you, thank you so much. These are my the teachers from which I have learned a lot. Professor Ahmad, Professor Zafar Zedi, Professor Asim Lobin and Professor Vijas. Thank you so much. This is a forum is open for the questions. Thank you very much, Hafiz. Uh, I think you have very comprehensively covered uh, this difficult area, which has been uh, issue of contention because of the lack of uh, good quality um, systemic treatments. And uh, But I think you have done justice to the job. And I hope that it must have cleared a lot of concepts. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to now do is to present some cases and uh, we're going to discuss in the light of uh, what has been described by Dr. Hafiz. And uh, although not all cases are metastatic, there will be some localized things as well. So we're going to look at some of the interesting cases so that the concept of management of uh, small versus large versus metastatic cancer is uh, understood. So again, it's going to be an um, interactive session. And uh, I would uh, ex like you guys to, to be involved in this uh, and, and cast your vote on a timely fashion. Okay. Can, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think I have to go on to full screen. Uh, the CT scans are visible on the screen? No. No, sir, CT scans are not visible. Okay. CT scan, we can see only the case. Yes. Is it visible now? Yes. yes. Sir. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's start with the first case, and this is a 66-year-old uh, controlled hypertensive uh, patient who is diabetic, history of ischemic heart disease, incidentally diagnosed with a solid renal mass on an ultrasound, and subsequently had a partial nephrectomy. Uh, and it was a clear cell carcinoma, T1A, which, months, which means that it was less than four centimeters. His preoperative creatinine was 1.4. However, his postoperative creatinine is 
And this is a, a preoperative scan. And you can see in the non-contrast scan, there is a suspicion of a lesion on the upper pole uh, <clears throat> um, laterally. And then this is the corticomedullary phase where you can see an uptake Whereas in the nephrogenic phase, you can see the contrast uptake by this tumor. And it was removed with a clear margin. Uh, I didn't do any, any frozen section because it came out nice and clean. And uh, so my first question to the participants and uh, Sharif can share the poll is that uh, should G CT chest be done in the preoperative staging of this patient with uh, T1A legion, and you can vote now. Okay, so I think uh, more than 50%, nearly 60% have voted. I'll just wait for three, five seconds more for anyone else who would like to vote now. Okay, fine. So, well, we are head to head uh, with yes and no's. And uh, one person has said it's optional. So let's see what the guidelines suggest. So before we go on to the guidelines, one more question. What imaging to use to detect the disease status in the post-operative surveillance? So this patient is now say three months post-operative and uh, he had a partial nephrectomy for a T1A tumor. What would you do in the post-operative follow-up? Remember, his creatinine jumped from 1.4 to 1.5 in the post-operative phase. Right, <clears throat> that's going well. More than two third have voted. I'm going to end the poll now. And there is a clear uh, thing that this patient should have a contrast CT. Now remember that contrast MRI is more dangerous than contrast CT. So contrast CT, we have significant experience by increasing hydration, giving patient um, uh, N-acetylcysteine preoperative pre-CT, one dose pre-contrast, one dose on the day of CT and one dose after 1.2 grams, either intravenous or uh, in the oral sachet format. And that decreases the contrast-related nephropathy significantly. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we monitor their um, hydration and uh, this way we can decrease the chances of the uh, contrast-related nephropathy. However, the nephropathy that can result from MRI contrast is very significant and it is at times irreversible. Does anyone know what is that... Uh, what is that nephropathy called? Which result from MRI contrast and the MRI contrast is gadolinium. Anyone? Uh, it's called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis and it can result in irreversible damage to the kidneys, okay? So if you have any concern about kidney function, contrast MRI scan is totally out. There are new modalities like contrast enhanced ultrasound, which is by introduction of microbubbles, 
And that is something that can be done. A non-contrast MRI is also an option. An ultrasound done by an experienced person is also an option. So if you look at the guideline, uh, the guideline suggests that you don't need to do a CT chest in patients who have an incidentally diagnosed T1A disease. Sorry about this. So CT chest is not needed in the preoperative evaluation of these patients. <clears throat> the second and uh, um, question that we ask is about the use of post-operative imaging in T1A patients. And the guidelines suggest that non-ionizing modalities, including MRI without contrast, contrast-enhanced ultrasound are better modalities than contrast CT if you have any concerns about contrast nephropathy. And this patient is at risk of contrast nephropathy. Okay. So uh, this is uh, uh, the agents which are used for um, contrast enhanced ultrasound. And these are various types of agents which are phospholipid shell or albumin shell and octofluoropropane is the agent which is used or sulfur hexachloride. Uh, unfortunately, these are not available currently in Pakistan. So I don't have any personal experience with the contrast enhanced ultrasound, but the data suggests that in good hands, contrast enhanced ultrasound can actually even differentiate between <clears throat> oncocytoma. Although oncocytoma uh, and angiomyelipoma from RCC. So that's, that's one thing that uh, can be for future once we have greater experience. <clears throat> we move on to the second case. And this is a 46 year old lady who had an incident. She's a school teacher. She had an incidentally diagnosed solid renal mass as you can see very clearly on the left lower pole. <clears throat> she had microscopic hematuria, creatinine is normal. She's planned for partial nephrectomy However, she's concerned about uh, the overall prognosis and she is uh, asking what her chances of complete tumor clearance after this procedure. So we need to give some objective answers to her. And these objective answers can be from data. So my next question is, and uh, poll number three, right? So you can vote now. The question is, what are the important clinical prognostic factors in assessment of the patient that we have discussed? So is it the tumor TNM stage, tumor size, tumor grade, RCC subtypes, or all of the above? So wonderful, I think almost all of you are getting involved in the polls now and I expect you guys to uh, continue with the trend and uh, keep voting. So I end the poll now with 80% uh, and vast majority uh, of you think that all of the above and I agree with that this is the correct answer that all of the above are important in the prognosis of patient with RCC. The next question is that grading is important and uh, the grading system are two. One is the Furman's grading and the other one is the new WHO International Society of Europathology grading. Which one should be used in, in patients with the RCC. Okay. I end the poll now and share the results with you guys. Well, it's neck to neck between the two grading system. We know that uh, the Furman's grading 
is something that we have used for a long time. And uh, this Furman is now replaced by the new WHO International Society of Europathology consensus grading system, which has been operational for the last five, six years. And this is something that we use now. So <clears throat> ideally, if your pathologist is comfortable, uh, he or she should do the WHO ISUP grading system rather than the Furman's grading, which is no longer um, conventional in the world. So the next poll, um, okay. So the next question is that should prognostic models be used in, in patients with RCC? Should they only be used for uh, localized and metastatic cancer or only in the metastatic settings? Okay, I'm ending the poll and share the result with you guys. Majority of you think that uh, they can be used for both metastatic and localized settings. So you are right. Although it's more frequently used for um, the metastatic setting and we know that the, uh, the IMDCC is the system which is most frequently used for this. So the Sloan Kettering Memorial System is being replaced by IMDCC, which should be used in the metastatic setting, but um, they are models available for localized disease as well, and they can also be used. So I think both answer I would consider correct. Let's look at the guidelines. And uh, the guideline says that in RCC patient, TNM stage, tumor size and grade, RCC subtype provide prognostic information. So all those of you who voted for in favor of all the above are right. Well, uh, the WHO ISUP grading system uh, is the modern way of classifying uh, or grading renal cell carcinoma and they should it should replace Furman. So ask your pathologist if they are still using Furman system to please switch to the modern system. And prognostic models be used for localized and metastatic disease both. Uh, molecular markers have no role in the current evaluation of patient with RCC. They are only for um, trials and studies. Okay. So I think so far so good, things are clear. Let's move to the next case. Now this is a 58 years old male who uh, is hypertensive for the past 10 years, a smoker. He is a huge man. He is over 140 kilograms, I think more than that probably. And he could hardly fit our table. Uh, obviously, he has obstructive sleep apnea. He has also has depression and has been on antidepressants. He presented about a year back. Uh, no, he has since one year abdominal distension. And since he's got a huge tummy, he was able to store this huge tumor in his tummy without any significant <clears throat> problems. So as you can see, that uh, you can see a bit of a normal upper pole and a bit of a normal lower pole. And this is a huge circumscribed tumor in the right kidney, which is pushing the, uh, which is pushing the IVC laterally and it was uh, clearly adherent to the IVC. Uh, however, it is clear from the liver and uh, uh, posterior abdominal wall as well in the lateral sigital cuts that we have seen. But this was a huge tumor. Uh, 
the oncologist actually has been seeing him and they have uh, recommended, uh, he also had a chest uh, CT and I'll show the chest CT. This is the chest CT and you can see there are nodules in the chest, multiple nodules in the chest. They first tried to biopsy this uh, RCC and they've done it times two. However, uh, they were not able to get the material for clear histopathological diagnosis because as you know, that histopathology uh, uh, type is important uh, in deciding about the systemic treatment for RCC. So the patient was presented in the tumor board and the tumor board consensus was that uh, if possible, this tumor should be removed and do a nephrectomy. And then we can have some pathology and subsequently we can treat him with medical treatment based upon his pathology. So uh, he underwent a, a radical nephrectomy, cytoreductive nephrectomy to be honest was a huge mass. And although we opened him up with a midline abdominal incision, we still had a lot of difficulty in removing this mass with a huge, uh, from epigastrium to um, symphysis incision, this mass would come out with a lot of difficulty. And the most interesting thing is that after the surgery, when I went outside, uh, and counseled the family. One of the family member was a, a physician. She said, I'm a physician, I'm a doctor. So I said, fine. And she said, doctor, why you have not done this procedure laparoscopically? So I don't know how to answer that question, okay. but anyhow. So we removed this tumor uh, with the help of our vascular surgeon. Uh, because the IVC was, a, was very closely adherent to this uh, tumor, it was removed and we were able to do a clean resection. The pathology came out to be papillary type 1 RCC and not a clear cell RCC. Uh, this tumor was about uh, 24 centimeters um, in length and uh, the, uh, the rest of the features were, as you can see here, uh, and you see that uh, this is a nice uh, pathology report, which not only look at the tumor focality, it was a unifocal tumor, as you can also see on the CT scan, the histological type to see if there is any sarcomatoid features, which is one of the risk factors, rhabdoid features, again, a significant risk factor, the tumor necrosis, uh, the WHO grade. See, this is the WHO grade, the ISUP grade, which I was talking about. Microscopically, it was limited. The margin status, uh, all the margins need to be defined so that we know uh, that we have done an R0 resection. And uh, although this is a metastatic disease, uh, the lymph node was removed and the lymph node metastasis was also not observed. So um, this was it. Okay, let's move on to the next case. And this is a case of a 30 year old female who presented with menorrhagia and was undergoing workup of fibroid in the uterus with a CT scan. And on examination, she was markedly obese. She had, um, uh, she was also a functional class zero and she, the rest of the examination was unremarkable. This was her CT scan. And this CT showed about 6.8 centimeter uh, upper and mid polar uh, renal cell carcinoma. And uh, the features were uh, a bit uh, confusing because if you look at these uh, markings that sometimes give you an impression it could be an oncocytoma. But because of the local extension and spread of the tumor on the posterior abdominal wall, uh, the impression was that this is an RCC. Because it is a T2 um, disease, nearly T2 disease, uh, she also had a CT of the chest and the CT chest showed one suspicious lesion 
in the right lung. So this is what it is. So an obese middle-aged lady with uh, uh, seven centimeter, nearly seven centimeter RCC with a suspicious nodule in the lung and the rest were all okay. So my question, uh, we go to the next poll. How should she be considered? Should, should she be considered for partial nephrectomy? Can we have the next poll? Uh, or she should be considered for radical nephrectomy? Should we do a bone scan or a PET scan first before uh, further decision for treatment? So if she comes to your clinic, would you do consider her for partial? And obviously you take a consent for partial slash radical, or you should do a, a radical straight without attempting partial. And, uh, or would you first do a complete metastatic workup before you consider her for surgery? So for a T2, would you consider doing a bone scan and a PET scan or just a PET scan? Right, so uh, more than about two thirds of you feel that she should be uh, offered radical um, nephrectomy. So this is the result uh, and uh, 60, more than 60% think that she should have a radical nephrectomy. Let's see what the guidelines uh, suggest. Before we go on to the guideline, another similar case, a 56 year old male controlled diabetes and hypertension. He's a landlord, he's a smoker, occasional alcohol, creatinine of 1.5 and uh, a hemoglobin A1C of 10.3. Hematuria with clots for the past three months and the CT showed a 7.2 centimeter left lower polar mass uh, with no lymphadenopathy. And the rest of the CT scan was fine and there is no other uh, disease as such. So there is no metastatic disease, it's just CT was also fine. Would you consider this gentleman, uh, can we have the next poll, for radical, partial, or you would like to do a biopsy first before you would intervene? So the next poll, please. You can vote now. Okay, most of you have voted. So I'm going to end poll and share results with you. Uh, and as you can see, that majority is in favor of a partial nephrectomy. Whereas uh, about 40% says radical nephrectomy and one of you thinks that a biopsy be done first. And I think this is a clear uh, uh, single unifocal without node or metastatic disease cancer. And surgical treatment is the treatment of option of choice. Even if it is comes out to be a oncocytoma, probably surgery is the way of going about. So <clears throat> biopsy probably is not indicated in this case. But yes, uh, radical versus partial nephrectomy is, is, is debatable and we will look into the guidelines to see what they suggest. Essentially, what you can see is the difference between the last patient and this patient and the difference in the poll that, the, uh, that we saw, majority favored radical nephrectomy for the last patient and um, majority voted for partial nephrectomy in this patient. 
The difference is probably that uh, there's a suspicious metastatic deposit in the lung in the first patient and nothing in this patient. So let's see what the guidelines recommend. So the retrospective study suggests that oncological outcome are similar for partial versus radical nephrectomy for tumors which are equal to or more than seven centimeters. So our cases fitted into this category of one of them was about 6.8 and the other one is 7.2. So they are about uh, that much. Uh, indeed, the post-operative complication rate is slightly higher for partial nephrectomy uh, if you do it for T2 cancers. In patients with localized disease without radiographic evidence of lymph node metastases, a survival advantage of lymph node dissection in conjunction with is not demonstrated. So uh, the quality of evidence is not high. These are 3B and 2B uh, level of evidence. So uh, really no uh, clear RCTs uh, is available to make a judgment. Well, uh, the recommendation, although because based upon 3B and 2B recommendations is weak, that offer partial nephrectomy to patients with T2 tumor, particularly if they have a prom problem with the other kidney. And since we know that the landlord gentleman was uh, uh, had a poorly controlled diabetes and his creatinine was also on the higher side, probably he would be better off saving as many nephrons as possible in, in that setup, okay? So I hope uh, so far we are clear and there are no further questions. Let's move on to case number six. Now this was an interesting uh, young surgical resident. This lady presented to the emergency room uh, and some of my residents probably would remember her is a 46 year old um, <clears throat> surgical resident who presented with acute uh, flank pain and urine tract infection. Uh, her ultrasound was done on her advice uh, or on her request and it uh, showed a suspicious lesion on the, in the right upper pole, of, uh, right uh, upper pole of the uh, upper pole of the right kidney. CT was subsequently done, and as you can see in the CT scan, that she has a definite mass in the upper pole of the kidney. <clears throat> and she is basically considering and wanted uh, to have lap partial nephrectomy. Um, so, the question is, <clears throat> that what are the advantages of lap over open partial nephrectomy? Is it <clears throat> better oncological outcome, better functional outcome, fewer immediate post-operative complications, or none of the above? Okay, so I end the poll now and share the results with you guys. <clears throat> so uh, this is the outcome and you can see <clears throat> that uh, the 40% <clears throat> thinks that it is better functional outcome. 40% thinks that there is fewer post-operative complications, whereas, uh, 16% as minority think that there is no advantage or no significant difference in terms of oncological outcome, functional outcome, and immediate post-operative complications between lap and uh, <clears throat> an open nephrectomy. Okay, so uh, I counsel her and I say that I don't do lap. So if she wants to get it done from somewhere else, I would suggest a good center because lab partial for this kind of tumor is a significant undertaking. 
see uh, she opted for open and I did an open partial nephrectomy. And if you remember, uh, if you remember the CT scan, there is a little parenchyma here, which is separating this from the renal pelvis and the hilum. And uh, this is a clear part endophytic, part exophytic, about 50% endophytic, plus 50% exophytic tumor. And when I did an nephrectomy, I, I did basically an enucleation of the whole. And you, as you can see, that the whole thing came out as one piece without any capsular breach. However, I was a little suspicious about that rim of parenchyma. And uh, once I removed, I, I took that rim of parenchyma uh, as well. Uh, fortunately, that didn't show any uh, in the frozen section and subsequently in, on, um, on histopathology that there was no disease in that rim. And I could have probably left it, but um, I just want to be extra careful. And um, so she had a complete uh, clearance, uh, no, uh, positive surgical margins, and uh, she's, I think, more than a year after surgery, and she's disease-free. This is another patient who had a significantly endophytic and almost all completely endophytic tumor here, and uh, again, <clears throat> we did an open partial nephrectomy, and it is almost impinging upon the hilum we were able to take it out clear. However, uh, once we took it out and uh, the frozen was negative, but this patient has a positive surgical margin, as you can see, that uh, there is positive surgical margin. So our next poll is focusing on these two cases, and I'm going to pose questions one after the other for your consideration. <clears throat> Next one, please. So if you have positive surgical margin, how would you manage this patient? Would you do an immediate radical nephrectomy? You do a redo partial with frozen section. <clears throat> and if the frozen section comes out positive, do a radical. You do active surveillance or start systemic treatment. Okay, so let's end the poll now and uh, I'll share the results with you. And I'm really happy with the, uh, with the opinion of our delegates and uh, that active surveillance is the way to go. Now there is very good data indicating that positive surgical margin after partial nephrectomy is not an indication of immediate nephrectomy. And uh, I'll just share some of uh, this data before. So this is the uh, EAU guidelines that uh, about the first question that I asked about lab or robot assisted versus open. Well, um, there is to be evidence that robot assisted or lab partial nephrectomy has shorter hospital stay and less blood loss. So it is better in terms of immediate post-operative things. But by and large, there is no functional and there is no um, oncological advantage of one over the other. <clears throat> Radical nephrectomy after positive surgical margin can result in over-treatment in many cases. So active surveillance is what is recommended for such situations. So intensify follow-up in patient with positive surgical margin. So do it more frequently 
and more extensively than you would have done otherwise. Uh, barring that, you don't really need to do. So if there is an alert, then uh, the treatment is indicated, but not uh, immediate partial radical infection. So I have about a few more minutes, so maybe one of the one or two cases, and then we'll wrap up. So this is a uh, case number eight, a 78-year-old um, lady, known case of diabetes and hypertension, had an ultrasound for microhematuria, showing a small solid tumor. As you can see, this is an ultrasound, which is showing a solid lesion. Here, this is the CT scan, which is showing essentially the same thing. Uh, and um, the question to you guys is, is there a size limit? Uh, should you treat this by, obviously these small renal masses are treated by either partial or by cryoablation or by active surveillance. So uh, the question in the next poll is that, is there a size limit for use of thermal ablation, which is microwave or RFA or cryo? Is the size limit different for RFA versus cryo and microwave thermotherapy? So, I mean, in this situation, uh, essentially, there is not one correct answer, but there is best correct answer. One of it is a best correct answer. But one of the other answer is also correct. Okay, let's end the poll. And I think uh, this is a very good uh, response from you guys. And uh, yes, there is, there's no doubt that there is a size limit to it. And that size limit is different from RFA to prior ablation. So when you're doing thermal ablation, uh, should you take a biopsy first? Uh, next poll, please. Do biopsy at the time of thermal ablation and do thermal ablation irrespective of the result or do biopsy prior to ablation and wait for histopathology? Okay, so I end poll now and uh, let's share the results with you. So majority of you think that uh, a biopsy should be done first prior to and wait for histopathology and then decide whether thermal ablation is needed or not. Let's look at the guidelines. There is a low quality evidence which suggests that uh, disease recurrence rate after radiofrequency ablation of tumors greater than three centimeter and after cryoablation of tumors greater than uh, four centimeters. So there is a different cutoff for uh, cryo and, and uh, RFA. Low quality evidence also suggests that high recurrence rate after thermal ablation therapies compared to partial nephrectomy. But again, these are low quality evidence as you can see that these are level three evidence. So the recommendations are that active surveillance uh, or thermal ablation uh, can be offered to frail and elderly people because the growth rate of small renal tumors is extremely slow or low. Uh, it is not more than one millimeter per year. So you can easily uh, do active surveillance for elderly people who are incidentally diagnosed with uh, uh, and uh, there is a strong evidence in support of performing a percutaneous biopsy first and then going for thermal ablation rather than doing it simultaneously or not doing it. <clears throat> right. 
So um, my time is over. So I'll stop at this point and um, I'll see if there are any questions or comments. Well, uh, systemic nephro nephro, I don't know what does that mean. Uh, there is a comment that deferring the immediate radical cystectomy has very weak evidence that patient should not be left with positive surgical mind can this lead to legal issues. I don't think that uh, this comment is, is right, but um, I understand that the uh, you cannot conduct a randomized control trial on patients who have surgical margins positive and uh, treat one group and the not treat the other group. But the current data that we have and decisions are made on the current data, uh, not uh, evidence-based, high quality evidence available for majority of surgical conditions, unfortunately, is that uh, the growth rate in terms of patients who've got positive surgical margin is low. So uh, they can be observed. And if there is any evidence of disease recurrence, then you take a decision. Okay, so if patient persist for redo, oh, the patient, uh, if the patient insists that, uh, no, they want to have that kidney removed or they want to have uh, a redo um, partial nephrectomy, that's, that's a different situation. Well, you can explain to them that uh, this is not really favored in current guidelines. But um, that's one thing. So remember the guidelines are recommendations. Guidelines are guide. They are not uh, the world on a holy grail. So you don't have to go exactly how the guidelines suggest. The guidelines have to be modified according to the local circumstances, according to the availability of resources, the expertise and so on. So guidelines are based upon published experience uh, in light of the recommendations coming from uh, the expert panel when they evaluate the evidence. And uh, so this is not the last word. <clears throat> so these are only recommendations. Uh, you can, if there is a better evidence available and you make decision based upon that, that's, that's, that's fine. So, right. Thank you very much for your attentive listening. And uh, I'll stop sharing my, and I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Naved Abzal. He is a consultant urologist in Dor Dorset. He has been a big supporter of our academic activities. He has special interest in robotic prostate surgery. And uh, his talk is focused on clinical decision-making in organ confined and locally advanced prostate cancer. So Mr. Absal, thank you very much for being here this evening for our Karachi Urology Week. Please proceed. Uh, good afternoon uh, and assalamu alaikum to everyone. Um, I'm very honored uh, Professor Hamad has asked me to give a talk on uh, localized and locally advanced prostate cancer management. So um, I'll keep this talk as brief as I can. Um, okay, so starting with uh, a little bit uh, of uh, track on prostate cancer is the most, uh, well, common second most frequent cancer. And uh, 1.3 million new cases diagnosed every year, fifth leading cause of death in men, and uh, around 360,000 deaths worldwide. Uh, that was statistics from uh, 2018. Um, 
And again, um, my practice based in UK, so is most commonest male cancer in UK. Uh, for nearly 40,000 men are diagnosed every year. 11,000 people die every year with prostate cancer. While in US, there are around 45,000 deaths every year. Um, every one in eight men will get prostate cancer in UK. Uh, while studies show where my practice is based in Dorset, we get one in six men uh, who will get prostate cancer. So maybe it's geographical or maybe it's the diet. We get some very good Dorset beef, uh, a lot of cattle and grazing grounds here. So, or a lot of elderly population in Dorset, people moving from London and other areas to live in countryside. Um, again, in Europe, um, most common cancer in Europe are males, and third most common cancer overall. Um, so I will skip this uh, st stats um, in from Europe, and then again briefly, uh, risk factors are age, family history, or any of your siblings or dad or uncles, race. Uh, prostate cancer, uh, if it's there, it is um, more aggressive in Afro-Caribbean population as compared to Caucasians or even uh, Southeast Asia, less prevalent. Maybe it's to do with diet because uh, the more vegetable uh, diet in Southeast Asia. And um, uh, it's uh, not an old man disease. Now we come across a lot of younger patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer in their 40s. Um, there's the symptoms, uh, LUTs, uh, which are the frequency, urgency, and hematuria, painful ejaculation. And moving on, uh, uh, not this prostate cancer is called silent killer. So not everyone will have symptoms. Sometimes, um, no symptoms, and it's um, just diagnosed with screening PSA. Uh, so we diagnose it with DRE, PSA, and there are other markers like the PSA3 and um, different other new PHI, ERG, and um, multi-parametric MRI is the gold standard now, the way we do gadolinium enhanced multi-parametric MRI and which shows pyrid three lesions or abnormality uh, which we recommend target biopsies and the other diagnosis briefly we do bone scans and uh, then a PET scan and uh, with the PET choline PET or fluoride but the PSMA PET is a gold standard high sensitivity and specificity specificity than the bone scan. And, uh, okay. Um, now, moving on to the EUA guidelines for screening. So all men are 50, but uh, the one with the family history should be screened at uh, year 45. Okay, so I'll skip this busy slide because we are going into the management. That's our objective. Uh, we should be screened, well-informed men should be sc offer screening. And skip this, moving on to, yeah, we'll skip this. And these are the age specific ranges, you know, 40 to 50 is up to two, and 50 to 60 up to three is normal, 60 to 74, and over 70 up to six PSA is normal. Um, so recommendations are with whatever there is like a, a raise age specific PSA, then we advise an MRI scan. And then if MRI shows lesion, pyrite, a tree or above, then we recommend biopsies. And this is the flow chart which we follow uh, in our hospital. So, when the patients are referred with a raised PSA, then they're offered uh, age-specific PSA, and we exclude UTI, and then they're offered uh, MRI scan, 
and with the MRI scan, uh, they uh, if there's an abnormality, then they are offered. Um, previously, we used to do transrectal biopsies, but not anymore. Everybody gets transperineal biopsies, as it's safer, a more diagnostic yield, and a less risk of infection if you're doing transrectal biopsies. And then we the biopsies are reviewed in our multidisciplinary team meeting, and then we make a plan regarding, uh, we recommend what is best according to their age, Gleason rate, comorbidities, where they're suitable for surgery, robotic surgery or brachytherapy or external beam radiotherapy, or just active surveillance or watchful waiting. So this slide is regarding trust and biopsies, which uh, we don't perform anymore due to the risks of infection and less yield. So, yeah, I'll skip that. We do transperineal template biopsies. Every patient gets uh, transperineal. And further, one uh, that's our technique. We, we biopsy every five millimeter. Uh, sorry, yeah, every five millimeter of the prostate gets biopsied. And then this is our Dorchester. This is a template map. We get uh, um, the image on screen where the we know exactly where biopsy is positive, what is the Gleason score, what is how much percentage is involved, and then we plan surgery accordingly. If you look at this slide, the patient has got more aggressive cancer on the right side. So this patient uh, was offered wide vaccine on the right side. There was only Gleason 6 on the left side, so he was offered no spinning on the left side. Uh, so this next one is an MRI fusion biopsy, where MRI scan, if it's a very big prostate, uh, we only target the lesion uh, where the pyrite abnormality is rather than sampling the rest of the prostate. It saves um, multiple biopsies, you can target the lesion, but you need to have a software where you can have this uh, MRI uh, superimposed on your transperineal um, biopsy screen. Then the Gleason grade, I'll skip, you all know this. Uh, and uh, then we go on to, um, yes, this demico risk stratification, that uh, low risk process, which are less than 10 nanogram per ml, and it's Gleason score seven or less and it's localized cancer, T1 uh, or T2. Uh, intermediate risk cancer, the PSA is from 10 to 20 nanogram per ml, and Gleason scores seven, um, and um, T2B, both lobes involved. High risk cancer or PSA over 20, Gleason above seven, which is eight, nine, and 10, um, grade four or five, and uh, this uh, T2C cancers, both lobes involved. Um, next, uh, and then we are locally advanced where it's T3, where the cancer has breached uh, the capsule and along with also their local um, lymph nodes, pelvic lymph nodes are involved. Um, so nodal imaging is performed with, again, with multi-parametric MRI scan. Um, can show up nodes, and we also offer a CT um, in more aggressive cancer and chest, abdomen, pelvis, where we want to see paraortic nodes involvement. So if the node in, is larger than 8 millimeter in pelvis and greater than 10 millimeter in abdomen, they're considered malignant. Then we do choline PET or PSMA PET scan. Again, I said the higher sensitivity then multi-parametric MRI or CT scan. Uh, but again, uh, PSMA PET, the nodes are less than five millimeter, then can be missed. So we can't see if the node is ever. Um, now this important slide, you know, that's what we are discussing, mainly targeting the treatment for localized or locally advanced prostate cancer. So locally, uh, if it's, we've got a low, low Gleason cancer, Gleason 6, PSA is under 10, uh, we can offer active surveillance that we monitor 
PSA and regular like every six months interval. And if there is a rise in PSA, then the patient is offered um, an MRI scan. And, uh, um, and uh, if MRI scan shows abnormality, then we offer um, uh, repeat uh, biopsies of the prostate. And then uh, the other options are that uh, if the patients have got uh, intermediate or high grade cancer, then uh, they are candidates for um, external beam radiotherapy, then IMRT, intensity moderate, uh, modulated radiotherapy. They can have brachytherapy if their prostate is less than 60 centimeter and they don't have lots. Or uh, HIFU, which we don't offer. I used to offer HIFU, but not anymore since robotic has kicked in. But uh, where it's uh, T1 cancer localized on one side, uh, low grade, they can have high intensity focused ultrasound to treat their cancer. And then uh, move on, go to offer open surgery. And then uh, 10 years ago, they used to offer keyhole surgery, laparoscopic radical prostatectomies. But now we have moved on to robotically assisted uh, radical prostatectomy, which is the gold standard. And then we've got other treatments uh, which are and have cryotherapy. Um, and uh, then you can have hormones uh, therapy to inhibit their growth. And then we have got newer medication, uh, which mainly they are for metastatic, which we are not addressing today. We are in unlocalized prostate cancer. And then uh, there is this uh, thing between what's active surveillance and what's watchful waiting. So again, if the patients are young, then we have to regularly follow them up every six months PSA and repeat MRI scans um, in a year time if the PSA is going up and repeat biopsy. So this is for younger patients. So this is called active surveillance. Well, in elderly patients who are over 80, who won't warrant any radical treatment, we offer them watchful waiting. That's uh, their less life expectancy is less than 10 years. And then we can set a target that you don't, don't have to have that PSA monitored that regularly, but um, yearly PSA. And if the PSA, let's say, goes over 20, then we empirically, we treat them with hormone therapy. Then again, uh, this slide is regarding comparison of open radical prostatectomy to uh, laparoscopic or minimally invasive radical prostatectomy. Obviously, lap prostatectomy was slightly superior than open radical prostatectomy, but robotic prostatectomy has virtually replaced both open and um, laparoscopic prostatectomy in the West where the robotic facilities are available. Um, and this slide is regarding uh, IMRT um, with intensity modulated radiation therapy, where this is a high grade cancer with endogen depression, deprivation um, for six months uh, to three years, depending upon the PSA and the grade of cancer. Um, then we move on to brachytherapy treatments which are um, LDR, uh, low dose rate uh, brachytherapy with um, um, different radioactive seeds. We use iodine 125 here, and their eligibility criteria are that their PSA, um, the prostate volume should be for brachytherapy less than 50 centimeter. We, you can't offer it for very large prostates. And then they should have their uh, IPSS score less than 12, so greater, uh, sorry, less than 12, and their flow rate should be over 15. If they're obstructed, and if you offer them brachytherapy, there's a risk they go into retention. And then we have got high dose rate HDR using iridium-192. Uh, this is for high-grade cancer, and you can even offer for T3 cancer. 
And then this is uh, the slide for uh, brachytherapy in plants. You can see it, a moderate side prostate, a radioactive seeds in both lobes. This slide is for a high intensity focused ultrasound. You can see there's a probe in the rectum and this is a high intensity ultrasound is being emitted. And uh, this is causes heat effect and um, subsequent apoptosis due to heat energy. And if you, sorry, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm not offering that. We used to offer it here at our institute, but not anymore because most of the patients are now uh, for robotic surgery. The advantages are a simple procedure, minimally invasive, better technique, reduce bleeding, less painful, smaller scar, foster, foster healing, and decrease hospital stay. They go stay overnight, go home the next time. And you can see as compared to the big scar with open prostatectomy, there are only four small holes for the uh, robotic ports to an east side and then uh, an umbilical scar where uh, we remove the prostate. And that's where the camera is, robotic camera is put in. And then, um, so the surgical outcomes are enhanced because um, there is a 3D imaging, uh, which is magnified. And um, again, we use uh, controlled um, abdominal insufflation uh, with carbon dioxide gas. The pressure, intra-abdominal pressure doesn't go very high. So that's why the outcomes are so much better. Patient feels so much better. And we use AeroSeal, which is uh, computer controlled pressures. And you see this camera, this is a 3D camera where you can see very good images, and especially it's very uh, advantageous for suturing, et cetera. You can see with the robot, you can wrist, you know, if you're doing open surgery or laparoscopic, you can turn your instrument to 180 degree, that's the wrist. But with the um, robot, you can turn it to 360 degree. There's no limitation. So you can, the suturing is so much better. And then you can have 3D and then it's 10 degree zoom, so better pictures. You can see the blood vessel better and you can do diathermy. And then you can see there's a finger console and which uh, helps uh, the surgeon dexter dexterity precision, uh, especially while you're doing nerve sparing. And that's the setup, uh, the console, surgeon sitting, and this be the patient and the next thing would be like teleoperating where you can remotely operate from another continent so these are different i'll skip through it's so robot starting from basic da vinci robot to x room and that will skip these and then there is a uh, different uh, now paper being published that uh, uh, robotic surgery is most cost effective although the cost of the equipment is uh, large, but then you save on the bed and then subsequent admission, less blood tr transfusion. So I'll skip these slides uh, here that a lot of you know, slowly the laparoscopic uh, prostatectomy has gone out and it's uh, robotic prostatectomy has taken over. So same why in Europe, you can see there are robotic centers now all over the world. I think one in Karachi as well. Uh, so I'll skip these nice guidelines. Um, so and a few more slides. That's a picture of Stanford University where I was trained in robotic surgery. Where I did my fellowship in 1996. And that's, uh, I'll skip this. Uh, this is the, my robotic theater setup. And um, uh, in terms of time, I'll go to the next slide. That's the port placement. Uh, for robotic surgery. And then that's we are connecting, docking the robot briefly. You see the robot is being connected uh, to the system. And then you can see from here that uh, further, uh, that's how I'm sitting on the console. And what I'm doing there is being replicated in the robotic arms or the patient. So, um, yeah, so a little bit you can see how things are being done. So that's my finger movements. 
dear. So, yeah, so this is Professor Atta Rahman, who is the president of your house. He was uh, visiting our theater and he was doing this recording. And you can see on the screen that that's uh, being uh, pre prostatic fat is being removed. So it's very precise. And uh, yeah, so moving on quickly, I'll skip this in terms of time. Uh, and uh, going, yeah, as so you can see a bit further, again, uh, yeah, Professor Atarman wants to show uh, that 3D image, what I see in 3D. So it is a brilliant picture, you know, you can see. Okay, so skipping that, and that's, you can see the end point, the anastomosis, beautiful watertight anastomosis, evenly spaced space suture. So that's uh, my 20 minutes. So I'll stop here. And uh, we have published our work. We have got our videos, our techniques presented in EAU and European robotic meetings. And uh, that's we have uh, yeah, got a lot of awards for our work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Navid Zal. It was a uh, very complex. You can take questions. So I don't see anything in the chat box. Uh, fine. I think everything is perfect and clear on local and locally advanced prostate cancer, various management option. So without any further time loss, because we are late by a few minutes, uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Zubair Chima, consultant urologist in Shafat Khanam Hospital, Lahore, who is going to talk about the technical aspects of partial nephrectomy. And um, this is uh, following in our focus of uh, prostate and kidney cancer for this evening. So Dr. Chima. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Hamad. Once again, uh, I hope you can hear me and the rest of the audience. Okay, I will uh, share the screen now. And uh, partial effect me here it is. Can you see the slides now? I think I've learned how to share it by now. Okay, so again, um, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for asking me to give this talk on the technical. Um, point of the partial nephrectomy. So what I've done for the purpose of uh, this talk, uh, especially for the benefit of the trainees, um, there are a few slides which I'm going to talk about and then uh, I will show you a video which will show you the different uh, steps uh, of the partial nephrectomy and hopefully a, a audience will find it useful. Uh, so uh, in terms of the technical points, uh, there could be a few points uh, before we decide on any patient embarking on the um, a partial nephrectomy, uh, some uh, during the surgery and obviously some post-operatively. So we'll try to touch them. So the first question which comes into our mind, why, why partial nephrectomy? Why do we need to do that? And I'm sure I probably missed the initial part of the meeting, but plenty has been discussed in terms of the evidence which is available uh, in terms of achieving the goals uh, by offering patients the partial nephrectomy or the minimally um, nephron, sparing sur nephron sparing surgery. So the main idea is to preserve the renal function, but does it also help with the overall survival, cancer specific survival or prevention of the cardiovascular events? These are the few bullet points which come into our mind when we try to offer partial nephrectomy to someone. And there's plenty of evidence available uh, in literature. Uh, although uh, the suggestions are that the, it doesn't really much affect the overall or the cancer specific survival, but definitely the preservation of the renal function and the prevention of the cardiovascular, even especially in the younger patients, um, uh, younger cohort of the patients, um, uh, it is very helpful. So if we look at the EUAU guidelines, yeah, there's a level 1B evidence that the oncological outcomes in terms of disease-specific survival following partial nephrectomy equals radical nephrectomy. However, offer partial nephrectomy to patients with the T1 tumors, okay? So yeah, so we have to select our patients carefully. So who are those patients? Another technical point. So younger patients. Now what's happening, um, uh, what we call as a victims of the modern imaging technique, uh, uh, a lot of small renal masses are being picked up um, um, in, in a younger population who are getting investigated for other things. And obviously, we are duty bound to do something about them, especially if we're suspecting cancer. 
So younger patients are one. Uh, patients with the, who got some comorbidities um, like diabetes, hypertension, who may well be fine now, but they have got risk factors to deteriorate their renal function down the line. So if they are fit enough to sustain a partial nephrectomy, they are the one who should be offered bilateral disease and single functioning kidney being the other ones. So once we have decided that, okay, we've got a patient, he's got a lesion which is amenable um, uh, to the partial nephrectomy, what next? What next technical point? And that, that, that I think is the, when you are doing your um, pre-procedure uh, preparation imaging, it is very vital to really be prepared what you are going to deal with on the day of the surgery so that there are no surprises. And there are, um, modern imaging uh, available in terms of CT MRI, make sure we've got angiographic phase so that we know uh, the uh, vascular anatomy of the kidney. So, so there are no surprises if there's a one artery or more than one artery. There are 3D imaging reconstruction available and even the 3D models being used in the West before uh, before offering them um, partial fragments. So have a look on these scans on the top, uh, beautiful scans showing exactly which vessel is supplying where. And uh, you can even do the selective, um, uh, selective um, uh, clamping of these vessels if need to be. Uh, again, 3D images here and some um, 3D printing, uh, which is getting popular in the West. Um, so, so make sure we've got the right imaging available. We have done our homework um, before uh, going in. So having done that, uh, there are different um, uh, nephrometry scores. So what, what do these nephrometry scores do? I mean, I think the one uh, which you're seeing on the slide is called the renal score. It, 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 it predicts the complexity of the case. So all you are looking at the radius of the lien, how big it is, and then you score is accordingly. Is it exophytic? Like you, you see here, the part here, more than 50% exophytic or less than 50% exophytic and more endophytic. Again, tells you if it's more endophytic, you're probably not going to see anything on the surface. So do you have a uh, do you have an ultrasound probe available or a friendly radiologist uh, who can, can come and help you and mark the lesion for you if it's purely uh, intrarenal? Um, is the lesion interior, posterior, and location in terms of the polar line? So then you score it um, um, and you get a low, medium, or high score. So it predicts what kind of difficulty you're going to embark on the day of the surgery. So that's another technical point. Uh, in terms of the surgical approaches, yes, you can do it. Um, open laparoscopic, both transperitoneal and retroperitoneal, depends how you have been trained, what's the complexity of the case, as far as the laparoscopic surgery is concerned. Uh, robotic is, is getting popular, and especially in terms of the um, uh, partial nephrectomy, a robotic is actually very helpful. You see the 3D images and the stitching is much easier. A hand assistance had, has been used um, uh, um, in many countries and pure laparoscopic, which probably is diminishing now with the introduction of the robot in the West. Um, so it all depends uh, what you have been trained and what facilities are available. But more so now, the more options are either open or robotic um, um, in majority of the countries. So when you're doing the procedure, what are you trying to achieve at the end of the day? What is called as achieving the trifecta? Yeah, you want to have a cancer control. You want to have a negative surgical margin. So you need to select your case according that um, it is the tumor is resectable um, in terms of the partial nephrectomy. We want to preserve the renal function and that depends on the ischemia time. Um, uh, more recently now it's the warm warm ischemia which is which is used. People have used the cold ischemia where they cool down the kidney for 10 minutes or so or so with the with the ice slash and that gives them more time to resect and um, uh, stitch the kidney bed and um, uh, uh, however, generally less than 30 minutes, around 25 minutes is generally acceptable. Um, and then also you don't want to have an intra or post-operative complication. So if you achieve all those three, you're achieving trifecta. Uh, so in terms of the steps involved, um, and I'm just gonna briefly name them and then we'll show, I'll show you them um, when I show you the video. Obviously you need to have access, uh, either it's open access or laparoscopic access. The bowel mobilization um, is the same as you do in the radical nephrectomy. You do the hiram dissection you take control of it, uh, you do kidney mobilization, especially if it's needed in an open case, you want to really lift the kidney out of the wound, tumor identification, um, clamp the vessels, tumor resection, renal reform closure, and I will talk about that when I show you the video, and I think it will be more helpful there. So before I show you that, I've got some pictures here of our cases in the past. 
to give you some idea how it looks like. And I'm sure most of you probably have seen it. So here you can see on the right, uh, on my left side, so hilum has been taken control of, kidneys under the hand, and that's probably the ureter. The kidney has been lifted up as it is mobilized all around. And the reason we do it, mobilize it all around is because then it comes up, especially if it's a deep patient and stitching becomes easier. And you can see you know, the lien there with the uh, with a bit of a fat, which we leave it on the top um, of the lien. Next on this side, you can see, uh, I think the uh, clamp has been applied and with the help of the diathermia, the scissors, um, you resect, um, wider to the tumor or enucleate it. Uh, that's what the bed looks like where you do the renal raffi and then you put the big um, uh, vicral stitches across the meat of the kidney and uh, you can put a surgery cell bolester in there and take the clamps off and that's how it will look like. Uh, I will show you in our case how it looked there. So this is our patient. I think he, uh, he was in, our, in his late 50s and uh, he presented to us uh, with this approximately, I think three centimeters or so. Uh, left-sided, lower, polar, uh, friendly location um, wise um, uh, lesion. Uh, majority of it was exophytic and you can see it in the sagittal end and the uh, axial scan. I think his BMI was around 37 or so. So he was uh, a bit obese. So uh, we offered him uh, um, laparoscopic um, um, partial nephrectomy because I thought um, will be able to do it seeing its location uh, is pr seems pretty friendly, okay? So what I'm gonna show now you is the video and talk to you, take you through the steps of it. Uh, so I'll press this new share and click on this, hopefully it will work. Uh, can you see the video picture now? I hope you can. Um, yeah. yeah, okay, brilliant. So uh, I'm gonna play it and then probably skip some parts of it so that we don't overrun in terms of the time as well. So here, so the initial steps have been done. The positioning is the same, which we discussed day before yesterday for the lap radical nephrectomy or adrenalectomy, but both sides are the same, which I showed you the day before. So here you see the colon has been mobilized immediately already. There's the swas, kidney has been lifted off the swas along with the ureter and the gonadal vessels. And probably here was the uh, gonadal vessel coming in. Since it was coming in my way, I probably decided to put a clip on it and uh, um, get rid of it. Um, and this is the renal vein. In this particular case, if I remember, the uh, renal artery was right uh, behind the vein a bit superiorly. So what I'm trying to do now is to gently tease away the fat above the renal vein to make a window there uh, so that at least I've got a control of the hilum. So initially I've tried it with the liga shore. Sometimes that those jars work and it helps, but sometimes if there's a bit of a tough tissue, you need a bit of a hook to make a window there and then uh, bring uh, uh, your Ligashore or Maryland um, uh, to create the window there. So just gently in the line, in the line of the vessel. So uh, bear in mind, you're working on Hylum, so with all attention. Um, so section, bit of a rubbing with the, with the peanut to get this, this, this fat. This patient has a reasonable amount of fat on this side of the Hylum. Um, so if I take you a bit forward on this video to show you. Right, okay, so again, I see, I probably created a window on the top of the vein already, and there's a window down, and what I'm trying to do is to um, dissect at the back of the vein to isolate that artery and trying to work it out uh, where it is, where I can feel the pulse, see the pulsations, but I can't get the glimpse of it. So, so I'm still working on it. Um, so, so when I was not having much luck on that because it was right behind the vein, I think what I decided that, okay, fine. So I need to get this vein away from me somehow. So I created a window across the vein very gently, uh, giving it its uh, due respect. And I thought uh, I will put a sloop around it. So that window has been created there. Uh, and then I'm bringing a sloop. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna sloop the vein and then with my left hand, I will pull the vein to the left side so that I can get better access uh, to the back of the vein. Um, so see, I've gently 
held it. Now I can access the back much more confidently and do my dissection down there to isolate the artery. So the idea is you isolate the hilum, you identify the vein, identify the artery. Uh, doesn't matter if you're doing it robotic, you're doing it laparoscopic or open, you need to have a control of the hilum because obviously we all consent these patients at the end of the day before starting the procedure for radical nephrectomy. So we need to have a, we need to have a control um, uh, of, of this area. So when, when you are doing uh, it open, yes, you can only uh, clamp the artery or you can clamp um, the hilum artery and the vein together. But when we're doing it robotic or laparoscopic, we tend uh, to isolate the artery and clamp the artery only. So I think I think I just about probably saw the glimpse of the artery down there in that window, uh, which I will show you in a second again. Um, yeah, so I can see probably the, uh, yeah, there it is. That's the artery coming up. Now I know where it is. So I'm gonna get rid of the tissue around it. Um, so that gentle teasing, um, uh, with a peanut swab, with a bit of a suction helps. Sometimes a bit of irrigation helps to delineate the tissue a bit more. Uh, continuous, just 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 being patient uh, and um, taking your taking your time uh, because this is this is a important step. So I know I know the artery is down there, so I can get rid of uh, this tissue there. So that's what uh, I'm doing. So hilum dissection is uh, is a very very important uh, step. Um, so let's move a bit forward to see if we have got control of this artery uh, in a couple of minutes time, I think somewhere here. So yes, here I'm probably putting a sloop around the artery now. So the idea to put, uh, you, you may say why I need to put a sloop around the artery because once I've identified it, I will put a sloop around it so that I've got a control of it. And plus after doing this step, I'm gonna go back to the kidney. Right, and then I'm going to isolate the tumor there and mark the tumor there and get it ready uh, for resection. So when it's ready, I want to come back to this area and I don't want to start digging into this place where there may be a bit of a ooze of blood and try to find the artery again. So once I've got the sloop around it, all I need to do is to pull the sloop and the artery will come in front of me. Oh, so I think, so that's there, yeah, okay. So, so that's so, so so these, both of these things are now uh, in my control. So once I've done that, so in this area, I have already taken the fat away from the, from the lean. You can see the lean down there. Kidney has been mobilized literally because part of this tumor was going posteriorly, but I'm all doing with the help of the scissors attached with the diathermy, I'm marking in my area, probably um, four to five millimeters, away from where I think the edge of the tumor is, I'm gonna mark it all around it. So this will be my marking step and then I'll be ready to resect on it. The reason I do the marking is so that when it uh, starts oozing, which it will uh, invariably, then I, don't, I know at least where my planes are since I have got lesser control compared to the uh, open surgery. So I've, got a, uh, I've done the marking down there, I've moved the uh, clip forward and this is a bulldog clamp, which is, um, in my hand and I'm coming and uh, trying to put it on the artery. So, so that's why I put these um, uh, rubber sloops so that I can, I can handle the artery you know, while I'm putting the clamps on, okay? So this clamp is going on, going in, apply it. Probably I'm not happy because I can see the clamp has gone through that orange bit. So I'm not happy that it now, oh, I readjusted it, gone back and seen with my camera that the tip is across it. So now the clock starts. Now, um, uh, I shout to somebody in the theater to start the clock so that at least I know uh, uh, in terms of the time, how much time I've got. And then I start resecting it with the uh, diathermy and scissors. So I use both energy as well as the cutting of the scissor. Now people do different ways. My way uh, of uh, keeping a track of the time, which is very vital why I'm concentrating here is to nominate somebody in theater, in theater who lets me know every five minutes that five minutes are over, 10 minutes are over and 15 minutes are over, okay? So that's such, uh, I've got my left hand here, which is helping me uh, to press the kidney on and somebody is coming in with a suction, which will be using the suction to uh, suck the blood and also to retract the tumor. It's, ideally it's, uh, 
if I've got a chunky bit of a fat on the top of the tumor here, that's very handy to hold. I couldn't get much on this particular case to hold on to, and it just peeled off, so which, which didn't help. But uh, I'm afraid that's how the cases will be. One day you'll get a good fat, one day you won't get a good fat uh, to cut onto that. So, so that resection uh, carries on. Um, so not much ooze at the moment, but it, it, it will happen. Uh, as I knew in this case, there, there was a bit of a ooze, but that was most of it was Venus, I think. Um, so I asked my assistant to help me with that, push it so that I can see into that uh, corner. So uh, as it's starting to do these cases, usually the left on the left side, uh, the lower pole lesions are the one which one should go for. And uh, I, as I always say, and I always try to follow that advice as well, start with the simpler cases, or make a cohort of that, and only then later on take the challenges cases and that, that that's a message in that as well. So I'm just gonna move it a bit forward so that we can see the stitching bit within the time. So that section is coming now, you can see a bit of the ooze coming down. So I'm continuing cutting with my scissors. Uh, you may think that I'm probably going to the tumor, but that's not the case. I can see the healthy, oh, where's my cursor gone? Healthy, healthy tissue there. And soon you will see the edge of the tumor. Then I will readjust myself. And if it does happen that you think that you have gone into tumor inadvertently, then you, you readjust yourself. So this is, this, is, this is a healthy tissue. This is the edge of the tumor here. So it kind of enucleates here as well. So... that resection carry on there. That's what's attached from the sides. So now you can see probably better here so yeah so the healthy tissue here and it starts enucleating so it's a combination of enucleation and resection if you can, in the right plane then you're okay uh, and it, it is pretty stressful especially laparoscopically it's pretty successful uh, stressful uh, because you don't have that tactile feel and plus um, um, the control is not as good um, as in open or even in robotic you've got um, uh, you've got a better control and better maneuverability so that, that, that that's out there so tumors out there so usually i park my stitches so the other thing which i do i park my stitches already in the abdominal cavity so that i don't have to come out so i usually hook them up with the abdominal wall from the inside so this is uh, the reno refi stitch so this is a um, um, v-lock stitch so the reason I like it is because you can see this is uh, braided. So when you take it through the uh, meat of the uh, kidney at the renal bed, when you're doing the renal refi, it, it doesn't slip back like, like the monocryl does. You can also use th uh, through your monocryl. So these are, these are the deep stitches in the meat of the kidney, which will take care of the oozers. Um, so I... Some people, so I start from the one end of the kidney. I've taken the outer stitch from outside to inside. At the end of my stitch was a hemolock. I don't know if you noticed, if somebody noticed it or not, or maybe it wasn't visible. And that's why it gets tacked. It gets tacked to the, tacked to the kidney. So I'm going deep into the meat of the kidney coming out and I'm going to start from one end and I'm going to come towards the second end. So this will be the renal bed. And this is the mainly to control the bleeders. And if there's a small opening of the, um, pelvic calcium system, not in this case, particularly because this wasn't that deep a lien. So here I come again, hold it, and then give traction from the other side. So this is going to carry on um, till this end. I'm just going to move it a bit forward again for the purpose of the time. So you can see there's a spot of the blood on the camera, but since I can see, uh, I rather continue because. Um, Time is the sense here. Of, as the clock is ticking away, your heart kind of starts sinking a bit, but you you carry on, um, uh, keeping yourself calm. And uh, 
So, and probably it was the end of this renal refi bad stage. Some people do it, um, especially in robotic, if there's a bigger defect, they do it twice, starting from one and coming to the other end, uh, and then from starting from this and going to the this and other end. But uh, in this particular case, I don't think that was needed. So once I've done that, you know, I will clip it here with the hemolock, and then I've got two mattress stitches, which are uh, two, two vicral stitches, I think vicral one stitches, which are joined together at the end uh, with the hemolock, right? So they're like a mattress stitches. So one of them I will apply there and one of them I will apply here. And these are like a big, uh, big uh, thick stitches, which you apply uh, through the meat of the kidney and you usually put the um, surgical cell booster and then you tie them on the top of it. So they act like that. Uh, and they act like they also control the bleeding from the edges of the kidney. So this is uh, this. Uh, so I'm going to push and pull the string and push the hemolock down there, leave it there. So here you can see, I think uh, I applied the one mattress stitch already there. And you can see that that was applied there. So this is the second mattress stitch which is coming. It's a nice deep stitch. So that's a vicral one coming from here. And then again, coming, going in. And this is going to give attention to, um, going to give, give these two edges together. So this is these two stitches are joined together with the hemolock here. So here is the hemolock, which is clipped to hold these two. This is the second needle, which is again, the end of it is joined to that hemolock. So it will act like a mattress. So again, coming down here. and taking the needle out on the other side, giving it due traction, and then applying two hemolocks here with the traction. So again, this, this is what is tightening it. And then if you are, sometimes these stitches can cut through if you're not deep enough. So yeah, it's better get it deep and first and so pulling the string and pushing the hemolock down, as you see here like this, so that it's tight enough. I'm going to the top one where I haven't applied or probably have applied, I'm just gonna tighten it a bit probably. So once I've applied these stitches, I will quickly go down to take my, uh, I'll probably, yeah, I will put a, probably a bit of swab there just getting ready if there's any small loose, it can look after it. And then go back to the area to take the bulldog clamp off. So coming down there again, I can see it there. Take it off, drop it down there. and come back to the top. So I will probably, um, I've got this swab there. Uh, I'll probably press it for a couple of minutes um, just so that if there's a little ooze, at least there's a pressure which helps it. Um, no harm in doing that. Uh, again, gonna move it forward a bit. So kidney, as you can see, looks pink. The clamps are already off. So swab is gonna come off in a second. So I'll take the swab off. And uh, what I'm then put is um, as every cell or flow seal, which is a hemostatic agent, uh, fibrin. Uh, it, it comes in this foamy and liquid form. And uh, that's really good, very good hemostatic agent, which will, um, if there's any little ooze that will take care of it. Okay, so I think that uh, brings to the end of this part of the video. So again, I probably have tried to show you the um, uh, steps which are involved in that and more or less uh, there are similar things, which are similar steps which are involved in different types, either you're doing it open or you are doing it um, uh, laparoscopic or robotic. So this surgery cell is, oh, sorry, flow seal is gonna stay there. And then I will retrieve the specimen. I'll put a drain probably next to it. And if I've got enough fat around the kidney, I will mobilize it and stitch it with a couple of anchoring stitches. Uh, so I'll stop the video there and post-operatively, um, right, okay, post-operatively, I usually monitor these patients uh, in, in high dependency care, especially for the first 24 hours, because I'm always worried about any risk of bleeding so that at least I can get a better monitoring there. Um, 
So that's it from uh, this video presentation point of view. I'm happy to take any questions or answer any queries. I, I mean, this is a topic where you can have a longer chat. You can talk a lot, but in this time, I think I was only able to show this bit. Um, Dr. Hamad, are there any questions or anything, any comments from your side? Well, uh, so far there is a comment about uh, the, uh, while taking stitch depth and margins of stitches, is there any cutoff value or is it depends on the personal preference? So probably what is being asked is that how do you determine how deep you go when you're taking the initial bit? So when we're doing, when we're doing the uh, renal refi stitches, the renal bed stitches, you really need to, <clears throat> the, the needle, which we use is a, the stitch we use is a three O usually, or sometimes four O. So it's not that big a needle. So you need to really uh, go deep, uh, the whole depth of the needle, uh, to take a better control of, of of the small losers. If you see that in any open pelvic calcium system, you you can stitch it that way as well. So yes, uh, deep stitches are better. Right. Um... <laughs> I think there are no further questions. So with this wonderful demonstration of lab partial nephrectomy and technical aspects, thank you very much for covering it in a short uh, span of time. Uh, so I think we come to the end of uh, this evening's program. Uh, tomorrow we have one to 4 p.m. rotation at Indus Hospital. And uh, Dr. Zaidi and his team are going to demonstrate part, uh, pediatric urology of various pathologies related to an operative procedures of pediatric urology. In the evening uh, at 5.30 p.m., we have uh, urolithiasis and urethral stricture. So we're going to have a couple of presentations, but two uh, interesting case discussions, one on urolithiasis and the other one on urethral stricture with our panel of experts. And uh, so hope to see you again tomorrow, uh, 1 p.m. for Indus, Euro Indus Hospital Pediatric Urology Rotation and 5.30 p.m. for uh, the conceptual base of urology course on urethysis and urethral stricture. So with this, I thank all the presenter for this evening, for the wonderful work. And uh, thank you very much and have a very good evening. Thank you very much, Shalafis.